We continue our study in Luke chapter 18, which we will get to in just a moment. If you uh, are on Facebook at all, and you see what I post on my Facebook page occasionally, you'll notice that this morning I posted about uh, Pope Francis coming out against all capital punishment. That goes against nearly 2,000 years of Roman Catholic dogma and their catechism. He has declared his intent to change the catechism and to change the dogma of the Catholic Church to declare that all capital punishment is sinful. Well, that has caused consternation within the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Francis, since he's been named Pope, has caused consternation within the Roman Catholic Church, but even now, more so, because they realize that if he goes through with this, and if it is successful, then you have a problem. If the Roman Catholic Church is the church on earth, which it's not, and if the magisterium is what it says it is, and the catechism is what it claims to be, then you've got a fundamental flaw. And that means everything that they have claimed for all these years is false. One theologian in particular has said such in the Roman Catholic journal First Things, and I think he hits it on the head. Of course, he tries to show the way out of that quandary toward the end of the article. But they see the problem. And it is going to be interesting to see what happens over the next five years or so, to see what takes place within that denomination and to see what direction they go with their catechism and with their dogma and even with their pope. You may very well see an effort uh, put forth to try to get that pope out of his office and put somebody else in his place. It's going to be interesting to see the developments that take place over the next several years. So keep a watch on that, if you will. Chapter 18 of Luke, however, is where we are. We left off with verse 15. And Luke writes, They were bringing even their babies to him so that he would touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they began rebuking them. The disciples were thinking, he doesn't have enough time to deal with this. This is not important. And why bother Jesus over such a thing as this? But Jesus called for them, saying, Permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. This contradicts denominational teaching, including Catholic teaching, by the way, but it contradicts denominational teaching concerning total hereditary depravity, saying that babies are born sinners. Uh, such is not taught in the New Testament. Such is not taught in the Old Testament. And Jesus quite obviously did not believe it. He said that we must be like a little child to enter into the kingdom. We must have that childlike spirit. Innocence, in other words. A child is innocent. A child is not born, as the Scottish uh, Calvinists would say, a little devil or little devils. They're not born little devils. They're born innocent, safe. If they die in that state, they are safe. They're not saved, but they're safe. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. It's just absolutely ridiculous. The story is told of uh, Raccoon John Smith when he was baptizing people uh, there in Kentucky after one of his extended meetings. He had attended a service of a Calvinistic preacher who was baptizing, quote-unquote, babies, sprinkling those babies as they were crying and pitching a fit. So when he was doing his baptizing after people had come forward to obey the gospel, he noticed that Calvinist preacher was standing not near the riverside. So after he got through baptizing, Brother Smith walked out of the creek and went right up to that preacher and took him firmly by the arm, started dragging him down to the creek. And the preacher was protesting. No, no, Brother Smith, Brother Smith, why are you doing this? And he, well, I'm just doing the same to you as you did to those children. Those children didn't want to be baptized as you did. And now you're doing this. So he was making his point. 
In other words, those babies were not willing. He's not willing. Yes, sir. One of them, uh, they also go to the conversion cases in Acts, such as Cornelius and his household, and they will extrapolate from that that there must have been babies in that household that were baptized, uh, which is simply not the case. That's implying or inferring something which is not clearly implied there in the passages. Uh, there are other passages, too, that they try to go to to prove uh, that we're born in sin, that we inherit Adam's sin. They go to Romans and do a Calvinistic reading of Romans saying that we inherit not only the penalty of uh, Adam's sin, we also inherit Adam's sin. In other words, it's passed on from generation to generation. That directly contradicts Ezekiel 18, the soul that sinneth it shall die, the father shall not bear the iniquity of the son, neither the son bear the iniquity of the father. In other words, you don't pass on sin from generation to generation. Uh, Calvinists John Calvin, in particular, the one that originated the tulip uh, uh, system, is responsible for more people going to torment than any one preacher or theologian that I can think of. Because that system has captivated and captured so many millions upon millions of people. Uh, and even though all five tenets of Calvinism are not held today by all denominations, still there are certain particulars of that system that are held rigidly by denominations, such as perseverance of the saints. Once you're saved, you're always saved. That's Calvinist. Uh, also, uh, let's see, total hereditary depravity is not held. Uh, let's see, limited atonement is not held. Irresistible grace is. In other words, you can't resist the grace of God. In other words, you can't do anything to receive the grace of God. You are completely helpless. Uh, you can't do anything to obtain salvation. But he, having said that, there are certain denominations uh, that are going through controversy at the present hour because there's a push for old-style Calvinism to, br to be brought back. Uh, and that's an interesting um, battle uh, back and forth. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a really good question. If we inherit sin from our parents, from whom did Adam inherit his sin? Fact is, he didn't. Yes, sir. The way that, that Brother Body just mentioned that, it almost makes it seem like, you know, if, in a matter of technically speaking, is Adam not the son of God? And be that the case, that would in a way indicate that God is capable of sinning, which he is not. God's responsible for all of man's transgressions and all of man's sin. Uh, it just has a fundamental flaw at the very uh, heart of the, of the doctrine. Well, here we see that Jesus obviously did not hold to that. He did not hold to the fact, or to the belief, I should say not the fact, but the belief, that children are born in sin and that we inherit sin. He says, indeed, if you do not receive the kingdom of God like a child, he says, you will not enter it at all. We've got to be innocent, innocent and childlike in our dealings with individuals. Now, in verse 18, it says, a ruler questioned him, saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And that seems a little bit of a strange response that Jesus makes. Why do you call me good? There is no one good but God alone. He's not denying the affirmation of the rich young ruler. He's not saying, hey, I'm not good. No, no, no. He's challenging that rich young ruler to think. Think about what you're saying. You're calling me good, but there's one good who is God, so what does that mean? He's trying to get him to think through the implication of what he says. Then he says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. Now some of my brethren over the years on the left side of the theological persuasion 
have really made fun of this in this way. They will go on and on elaborating on this uh, particular verse and they'll try to say that the rich young ruler was arrogant, that uh, he was boastful, that he really didn't keep all of these things. In other words, they're trying to make the rich young ruler like a proud, puffed up, arrogant individual. Does the text say that at all about him? I don't see it anywhere. When you go to the other passages that describe him, does, do those passages ever say that he was arrogant or that he was proud or he was lying? No. None of those passages say it either. What was Jesus' reaction? Does Jesus say, wait a minute, you didn't keep all those commandments. You're saying you kept them, but you really didn't keep them. You know, some of my brethren have actually said that in commenting on this passage, that Jesus knew he really didn't keep all those, all those commandments. It's not what Jesus says. Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Jesus doesn't correct him. Notice, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Notice that. He didn't say, oh, wait a minute, you need to go back and do this and this and this that you said you did but really didn't do. No, no, no. He says, one thing you still lack. The other gospel accounts indicate that when he said this to Jesus, that Jesus loved him. He looked on him and he loved him. He was favorably impressed with this young man. He was really impressed with him. And he says, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. There was one thing that this young man needed to do to really be a true follower of Jesus. One thing that was standing in his way and it was his possessions. It was his riches. Now Jesus is not telling us here that riches are evil. Remember, the New Testament does not say money is the root of all evil. No, no, no. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, literally. So the problem with this rich young ruler, if there was one problem at all, it was his possessions. Watch his reaction. Verse 23. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. He was very sad. Other gospel accounts tell us that his countenance changed. In fact, if you look at the Greek text in those passages, it indicates that there was a visible change, a visible change in that young man's demeanor. One even indicates that it became very dark. In other words, it re he really not just changed, he was going to a bad place, in other words, in his mind, apparently. Uh, that indicated the depth of the problem for this young man. And so Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Notice, he doesn't say it's impossible. He says, how hard, how hard it is. Verse 25, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now I've heard over the years, and you probably have too, some uh, preachers and teachers who say that this needle is a gate in Jerusalem where camels would stoop down and have to crawl under to get into Jerusalem. You've possibly heard that or seen it in print. Problem with that is, that's not the word that's used here by Luke. The word that is used here in verse 25 is the word balones, balones, which is the word that can only mean needle. That's the only meaning for it. In fact, it's more akin to a surgeon's needle. Luke was a physician, was he not? He uses the word through inspiration of the Holy Spirit that can only mean needle. So get the picture. 
It's easier for a camel. You've seen camels. We saw some camels up at the Ark Encounter a few weeks ago. A camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's, that doesn't go together. In our mind, it's, who can do this? He can't fit. It's easier for that to take place than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, then who can be saved? They see the implications of it. They're not thinking, well, it's that gate over in Jerusalem because, by the way, that gate did not exist at the time that these things were said. That was a later thing that took place. Still, they see the implications of this. Who can be saved? Notice Jesus' reaction. He said, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Notice that. When God is in the equation, things that we think are impossible become possible. And in fact, you look through the New Testament. How many times do you see rich men and women who are faithful followers of Jesus? You find several. Several, in fact. So what Jesus is emphasizing here is being careful, careful with what we have. This young man was extremely wealthy. That was the impediment for him to become a true follower of Jesus. And in fact, we can have the same attitude when we have just a dollar in our pocket as much as we, if we have a billion dollar trust fund. It's the attitude that we have to our possessions that is the key. Don't let the possessions possess you. That's what Jesus is trying to emphasize to us. several instances where the Bible uses like metaphors, figures of speech or sure. things like that. Sure. And you know, I feel like that was a great one of the great examples there because that because it's you know, to the human mind it is literally impossible to picture something that you could only see in like a Hanna Barbera cartoon like that. Yeah. Well it's a metaphor obviously, but it's also one that's vivid. It's something that these people that heard it, they picked up on it quick. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying. You're saying it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. They, they, they see the implications of that. But then Jesus adds, with God all things are possible. And indeed, that is the case. Peter said, behold, we have left our own homes and followed you. Peter's saying, you know, we've given up a lot. We've given up a lot to follow you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come, eternal life. So many people have followed Jesus and have forsaken everything of this world's goods and this world's prestige. And yet, compare what they've forsaken to what they have. I'm thinking about a good friend of mine who preaches the gospel in California. He was in Florida. He moved back to his home state of California to preach. He had been a Mormon. He left Mormonism and obeyed the gospel, went to preaching school, became a preacher and a teacher, by the way, and doing very well, he and his family. Before he obeyed the gospel, before he met his wife, he was working in Hollywood as a makeup artist. He worked on some very big television shows and movies, in fact. Very gifted in that regard. Uh, he was very successful. He gave all that up to obey the gospel and to preach. And we're better off for it. He's uh, doing so, so well as far as spreading the gospel and as far as ta telling the truth about the Mormon church and his experience and why he left he has so many more friends and so much more success. And, and, of course, what Jesus says, in the age to come, eternal life. That's the kicker. That's the, the, the crux of it. Eternal life in the age to come. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. 
And all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day he will rise again. He's telling them exactly what is going to happen over the next couple of weeks. He's telling them that the Romans, the soldiers, the Jews, they're going to take him and persecute him and beat him and then put him to death. But after the third day, he will rise again. Notice the reaction. But the disciples understood none of these things. And the meaning of this statement was hidden from them. And they did not comprehend the things that were said. And sitting as we are in 2018, reading the complete text of the scriptures, we think, how could they have been so dense? Why could they not see what we can see? That's the problem. They could not see it because they did not have all the information that we have. And in the disciples' minds, they could not comprehend how the master would be put to death. They just couldn't fathom it. And to be resurrected the third day, they believed in the general resurrection. They believed in the final resurrection, yes. And they, of course, were familiar with the Hebrew Scriptures, which talks about people being raised from the dead. They had even seen Lazarus be raised from the dead after being three days in the tomb. But to Jesus, they just could not comprehend that. So let's not be so difficult and so hard on the disciples for not understanding it. Put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in their sandals, I should say. Put yourself in their sandals. Think as they thought. They would not understand this. How could they? But later, they will. Yes, sir. Thomas asked for evidence, and we call him Doubting Thomas, and, and that is the case he did doubt. He wanted the evidence. He wasn't just going to accept somebody's word for it. He wanted evidence, and that's commendable on his part. And Jesus did not condemn him for it. He actually produced the evidence, and he is indicating, blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. We are convinced on the evidence. What evidence? The scriptural evidence. We have not seen Jesus with our own eyes. We have not put our hand in his side and put our fingers in his nail prints, but we believe. Why? Because there's evidence to know that Jesus existed, that he lived, that he died, that he's resurrected from the tomb. And so we are convinced on the basis of that evidence. But at this point, the disciples didn't completely comprehend this, but they would later on. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. This is by the eastern gate, by the way, of Jericho. Now, hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, 
they gave praise to God. Now, in other gospel accounts, this man's name is given. His name is Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus is what he is called. And there's another individual with him in the other gospel accounts who does not say anything. But Bartimaeus is named, and he's mentioned here, even though he's not named by Luke. Notice the process of healing. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well, and it's immediately, immediately he regained his sight. It wasn't a process. It wasn't something that happened over a period of months. It was something that happened immediately. Now, there's one instance where Jesus healed where it was a process of healing, but it wasn't over a period of days or weeks or months. It was over a period of minutes, in fact. But in this case, he was healed immediately. And they knew that it was a miracle. It was an obvious miracle. And they were glorifying God and gave praise to him. Any comments or questions about this before we get into chapter 19? All right. He entered Jericho and was passing through. Now this is one week before the crucifixion. One week prior. This is on the Friday prior to the week of. And this is about 17 and a half miles from Jerusalem. It's not a long stretch according to the way that we think of distance, but it was a long distance for those who had to walk it. So it was 17 and a half miles one week, from, uh, one week before crucifixion. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. We remember that, don't we? Of course. Well, this is a very vivid story, is it not? This Zacchaeus was likely a subcontractor. He was a subcontractor for the Romans. Zacchaeus himself was Jewish, as we're going to see later in the story. But yet he was working for the Roman government. And tax collectors were one of the most despised groups of people that you could ever have in the first century. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was. It was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. He was a short guy. Nothing wrong with being short. We're not told how short he was. My dad was the shortest of all of his uh, brothers. All of his brothers were six feet and over. Daddy was about five nine with his shoes on. And uh, Daddy said, well, I'm, all, I'm tall enough to reach the floor. Well, that's the truth. All of us are tall enough to reach the floor, are we not? Well, Zacchaeus was short. We're not told how short, but yet he was short. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him. For he was about to pass through that way. Now, if you're familiar with sycamore trees in the Middle East, you know the sycamore tree is not a tall tree. It's not a tall tree at all. In fact, it has a low trunk and spreading branches, a very sturdy tree, but not a tall one. Uh, it was thrived in a warm climate, which, of course, Jerusalem, Jericho was. So he thought, if I can get up in that sycamore tree, we're not climbing up, he'd be just climbing up to the top of a sycamore tree, and give him enough height to where he can see him. So it says, he, uh, when Jesus came to the place... He looked up, so that sycamore tree was up a little bit from Jesus' line of sight, and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Zacchaeus, come down from there, if I'm going to your house today. Remember that song, of course. Well, what is this? The significance of this is, this is the only time that we have record where Jesus invited himself to go to somebody's house. In every other circumstance, he's invited to come to someone's house. In this case, Jesus invites himself, I must go to your house. Wouldn't that be something? The Son of God telling you, I must go to your house today. Well, look at this. He hurried and came down. You can just see him scrambling to get down that sycamore tree and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble. Bless their hearts. That's my addition. It's not what Luke says. Saying, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. 
They perhaps wanted Jesus to show kingly pride. I'm not going to lower myself down to the riffraff and to those who are of a lower station. That's not how Jesus was. He wasn't like that. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. He was wealthy, extremely wealthy, obviously. And he was very honest. Very honest. He says, if I've mistreated anyone, I'll pay it back four times as much as was done to them. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. This was one of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus went to them first. Zacchaeus was a backslidden Jew who needed to come back to the Lord. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This verse right here, brethren, summarizes the mission of Jesus. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If that is not at the heart of everything that we do today as his people, as his church, then we've lost our way. We've lost our purpose. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The church of our Lord must seek and save that which was lost. Is that not part of the great commission that's given by Jesus in Matthew 28 and Mark 16, and as we're going to see in Luke 24, to go into all the world, preach the gospel, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Is that not what we're supposed to be about the business of doing? Preaching the gospel, teaching the lost, restoring the erring? We've got to be about the business of what Jesus did. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That must be at the heart of everything that we do. While they were listening to these things, now we're still in Zacchaeus' house when Jesus is about to say this. Everybody's gathered there, all the guests that are with Jesus. Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. All these people gathered around Jesus, they're thinking, okay, the Lord is here. He's close to Jerusalem. The kingdom, that is the conquering kingdom, is about to be manifest. Jesus is going to overthrow Roman rule and Roman authority. That's what they've got in their mind. But Jesus tells a parable. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas. A mina is worth about $17, by the way, and a mina is equal to about 100 days' wages for the average Jew. And said to them, do business with this until I come back. And notice he's gone to a distant country. That distant country would be heaven, quite obviously. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared saying, master, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, good slave. Because you have been faithful in a very little thing, you are to be an authority over ten cities. The second came saying, your mina master has made five minas. And he said to him also, and you are to be over five cities. Another came saying, master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, by your own words I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you not know that I am an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? 
But why did you not come? Why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, Take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Now what is his point? His point is simply this. Use what you have for the Lord. Because if you don't, it will be taken from you. This story is a very, very familiar one because it's very similar to what he tells in the book of Matthew, the parable of the talents. Five talent man, two talent man, one talent man. Very similar, but different in certain circumstances, certain particulars. He's simply saying that you've got to use what you have and not squander it because you will be held accountable. Any questions, comments before we move on? After he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. That's literally, by the way, going up because Jerusalem is higher elevation than the rest. When he approached Bethphage and Bethany, near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on, which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus, and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. Now how did Jesus know this would take place? Well, he's the son of God, obviously. But is it possible that these individuals who owned the colt had a prior connection with Jesus? Quite possible. It's quite possible that when we're not told, that is, and it's not recorded, that Jesus possibly sent word ahead to these individuals that he's going to have need of their cult at some point. Not telling them when, but then he tells the disciples to go indicate to them and they would know. At any rate, Jesus knew that this cult would be available for him. And then it says, as uh, uh, verse 35, they brought it to Jesus, they threw their coats on the colt to put Jesus on it. As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road, taking off their outer coats and putting it ahead of Jesus. You've heard of the red carpet treatment? Well, they're giving Jesus the red carpet treatment coming into Jerusalem. In fact, Mark's account tells us that others spread branches, that is, palm branches, ahead of Jesus as he was coming in. As soon as he was approaching, near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. Now we pause right here and ask the question, where were the religious people? Where were the scholars? Where were the Pharisees? Where were the Sadducees? They're nowhere to be found. None of those categories of people are anywhere here. Who are doing this? The disciples of Jesus. The common people, as we would call them. Everyday people. They were the ones who were making way for Jesus to come into the city, shouting, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. That's a direct quote from Psalm 118, 26. They're praising Jesus as he's coming in. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. All the Pharisees show themselves now. They're showing up. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. That's a, that's a humorous way of responding to them. You just can't keep it in. You can't keep it to yourself. They've got to rejoice. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. 
one of the examples of our Lord crying. And he's weeping over the city of Jerusalem, saying, if you had known this day even you the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Is looking forward into the future to the time when Jerusalem would be completely ransacked. And it's a direct result of them rejecting Jesus. He's weeping over it. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling, saying to them, It is written, and my house shall be a house of prayer, Isaiah 56, 7, but you have made it a robber's den, Jeremiah 7, 11. These are two passages he's referring to. The cleansing of the temple that we read about in Matthew's account. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. And they could not find anything that they might do. For all the people were hanging on to every word he said. Even at this late stage of the game, Jesus was still commanding a large crowd of people. People were hanging on everything that he said, but his enemies were busy at work to try to destroy him. This is where we're going to leave off this morning. We'll take up with our study next.